Okay, hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webinar, Unlock Funding for Your Schools, How to Leverage the E-Rate Program. My name is Kevin Hogan. I am the Content Director for eSchool News, and I am happy you're joining us today for what I know will be a very insightful and important conversation. This event is brought to you by United Data Technologies. UDT is a technology enabler that helps clients in major industries evaluate, architect, provide, secure, and manage technology on the go, in the rack, and in the cloud. UDT provides flexible and interoperable services, including mobility, cloud, collaboration, data, cybersecurity, and software and IT as a service. The company also provides technical, professional, and managed services. Now, before we get to our conversation, I'd like to take a minute to go over some of the features of the platform that we're using here for this webinar. The event is being recorded, so you don't have to worry about missing anything. Within a, few, within a few days, you'll receive an email message that contains a link to the recorded webinar, along with a PDF of the slides. If you have a question or a comment for us, there is a chat function that you can use. Please feel free to use this also to contact someone from the eSchool News team if you have a technical question. But I encourage you, you know, as we go along, it's, it's great for the panelists and for myself to understand the information that you're looking for, and maybe some of the ideas that you want to share to make the conversation even more engaging. So with these housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started with our conversation and with some, some introductions. Starting off, uh, Bob. Bob Richter is president of E-Rate Provider Services. Bob has broad and deep experience with the E-Rate program from both the applicant and service provider perspective. From 1996 to 2003, he was the executive director for technical services of the Hartford Public School Systems in Hartford, Connecticut, and had direct responsibility for all universal services fund activity. The E-rate applications he submitted achieved over $35 million in federal funding for the school district and for the city's libraries. From 2004 to 2009, he was the national E-rate program executive for IBM supporting their teams and clients in the K-12 education industry in the East Coast of the United States, and left to open his own consulting company, E-Rate Provider Services. He served as founding director for the E-Rate Service Providers Association and is currently a member of the E-Rate Management Professionals Association, having just completed a term as the vice president and chair of the advocacy committee. I'll be asking Bob what he does in his free time later. That's a lot of stuff, Bob. Um, also on the panel here today is, is George Fernandez. George is the Vice President of Managed Solutions at UDT. George has accumulated over 25 years of experience leading the design, development, and implementation of high-performance technology and information security and infrastructure solutions and strategies. He has a strong record of success in managing robust IT high-reliable organizations and a proven ability to bring the benefits of IT and IS to solve business issues. As the Vice President of Managed Solutions, George specializes in processes, procedures, solution building, pricing, budgeting, and presentation of technology solutions. Leading the pre-sales and managed solution product efforts and teams for the managed IT as a service division of UDT, his focus is on customer needs and satisfaction. So with that, it's obvious uh, our two presenters here today have a, a wealth of insight and information on what, uh, as an ed tech journalist since about 2003, I consider probably one of the most robust, successful programs um, that I can remember when it comes to implementing technologies into schools. Uh, as Bob's uh, bio represented in 1996, I believe, was when the E-Rate program began. And um, I guess to date all of us, um, at that time, the, probably the needs of districts and their technologies were a little bit different, Bob, right? Why don't you kind of give us a little bit of a history of where you started back there at Hartford, Connecticut, and the needs of that district at that time and kind of the present state of play of needs for districts today. Well, the the uh, Hartford when I started there was the fourth poorest school district in the nation in the richest state in the union. Um, 
the the the, the technology. I, I I I almost hesitate to to label the um, label a technology. We had uh, schools were sending their attendants over twenty four hundred baud modems to a vax mainframe. Wow. Um, it was it was just terrible. So and I started there in nineteen ninety six. The first year of the program was nineteen ninety eight. But um, we got a visit from Carol Rock from the State Department of Education, who said basically, hey, there's this program coming down and we think it's going to kind of work like this. It's going to turn, you know, a uh, million dollars of district uh, funding into a $10 million network because um, Hartford had got a 90 percent discount. So we figured out what we could what we could do with that. And their bids were flying. There, there was uh, construction folks all over the place, and uh, and and we did, we did, we did pretty well for the uh, for the first um, for the first year. So the initial oh. program configuration, um, essentially, there was a couple of different flavors of category uh, category. I'm sorry, priority one in the beginning, but there was only one flavor of priority two, which was internal connections. So all the stuff inside the school building, which was the priority two, um, all came out of the same pot of money. And the reason it was called priority one and priority two was priority one funds or applications got funded first. So they did all of the priority one applications before any of the priority two applications. And the first year of the program, I think there was under a million dollars uh, sorry, under a billion dollars worth of uh, priority one applications. So everything got funded under priority two. But as the the program went on, um, the, the, the priority one grew out of the $2.25 billion total. The, the, uh, the priority one applications grew until they, they started um, cutting down on the amount of priority two money that was left over. So then the the richest schools fell off, and that it it, it, it kind of snowballed into the into the fact that there it, it's at some level the priority two applications weren't going to be funded at all. The priority the priority one applications were going to take up all of the space. Um, and by in, internal connections, the, the 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 single priority one bucket. Um, Everything, everything under category uh, priority two could be found in there. So, if you wanted to buy a router or a firewall, that would be priority two. If you wanted to get maintenance on it, now, for example, if you wanted to buy a, a Cisco router, that's priority two. If you wanted to get it installed, also priority two. If you wanted to get SmartNet, also priority two. So, it was all all those goods and services were in in one bucket and and treated the same way. In 2003, the, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm just to say, and then the the turn of the century occurs, right? And yeah. the technologies they get a little well, uh, bit wider than 2,400 baud. <laughs> yes, but what they what the what the FCC found out by by doing some audits and talking to folks is that um, the large urban centers were essentially refreshing their networks every single year, and they were taking a huge amount of a huge amount of of money. New York City. When I started working at IBM, IBM had the New York City contract, and they were doing three to four hundred million dollars per year in cat in, in in total e rate e rate funds. So it's a lot of money. So in so in two thousand three, the FCC finally responded uh, by doing a couple of things. First of all, they implemented this thing called the two and five rule. So the two and five rule said that. Um, in any particular building, um, it, it could get category uh, priority two funds any two out of any five years, year one and two, and not three, four, and five, year one and three, two and five, didn't matter, any two years out of any five years. But to do that, based on the comments that they got when in preparation, uh, they had to create a second subcategory of, of priority two called basic maintenance. So really what they wanted to do was set up a three-year technology refresh cycle. So you would have, you'd buy a router, you'd buy the Cisco router in year one and get SmartNet on it year two and year three. Get another router year four, 
SmartNet five and six. So they set it up. They set up two different categories of service: category uh, priority two, internal connections, and priority two, basic maintenance. Um, was that an attempt, do you think, to to uh, start establish some sort of sustainability strategies for districts to understand that this isn't just like a a one time purchase and then you're done, but you kind of need to continuously maintain and and, and upgrade. <clears throat> I, absolutely. Um, essentially, what they're trying to do is bring the the demand for priority two services down, so that the the folks that weren't as disadvantaged as as your Hartfords and New Yorks and Chicago's and LA would get would get some of the money. So, essentially, the the the, the build out services were internal connections. So, buying a router, getting the router installed. Uh, priority two internal connections. But the keeping the lights on stuff, the basic maintenance was a smaller subset of service that was basically reactive in nature. So if something broke, you could get it fixed. There was some, there was a limited amount of proactive services that were bundled into that, like disk defragmentations. You know, you could do that type of proactive um, stuff um, similar to an oil change in a car was is was the the analogy that got that got used at the time. Yeah. Um, now, between two thousand, so that was two thousand three, the third report in order. Two thousand four saw the uh, fourth report in order, which made some significant changes to basic maintenance. So the FCC, in their in their audit process, determined that. Um, what districts were doing was they, they were putting SmartNet on their routers. So if they had five routers, they would put SmartNet on all five of the routers that they had. But they were determining that in many cases, those routers were not breaking. So they determined, for good or for bad, that they were wasting government funds by putting SmartNet on a router that did not break. So they changed what they would fund under basic maintenance um, and said, basically, we're, we're not going to fund SmartNet anymore because SmartNet is break fix and some other things. So Cisco and others went back and said, well, yes, SmartNet covers basic maintenance. And I'm picking on, on Cisco here because it's it's the, the elephant in the room, but um, it, it is everybody's, man, you know, every manufacturer in their in, in particular maintenance product. Um, so SmartNet covers break fix, but it also covers phone support and software version upgrades. So Cisco negotiated with them and the FCC said, basically, we don't want to pay for the break fix that gets paid whether anything breaks or not. So Cisco went and created something called Cisco Base, which removed the break fix and was 81% of the cost, which is why SmartNet is 81% eligible because they they determined that um, at the time, I'm not sure if it's changed now, but they determined that 19% uh, of the cost of their SmartNet product was break fix, uh, which they would pay, in, you know, um, which they had been paying. Um, and so what they determined was they wanted basic maintenance to be done on a time and materials basis. So applicants began um, putting in applications for a, a set amount of parts and a set amount of labor. The downside to this is if they had a year where some, nothing broke, then they would end up giving back money that they'd said that they'd applied for. If they applied for a, a $30,000 budget for break fix for their, their 10 routers and none of them broke, that $30,000 would be returned to the fund. Um, as, the, as the program um, evolved beyond that, um, the, from a procedural standpoint, the FCC and USAC began requiring more, um, uh, a higher threshold of documentation in terms of what they would pay. Uh, so technicians would have to count their mileage. They'd have to get a sign in and a sign out. They'd have to keep track of the exact parts that were used, the exact labor that was used, and it became very paperwork intensive. So that brings us up to 2014 when the E-rate modernization order came out and that did a number of things. First of all, 
Um, it changed the the wording from priority one and two to category one and two, which is still in use today. Um, they went to a per building budget and got rid of the two out of five rule, which was really kind of kind of kind of cumbersome. So over a five year period, a bill uh, a particular building had money based on how many kids the building has. I think it's one hundred fifty dollars a student initially times 1,000 kids in a particular high school. So they had a $150,000 budget over five years. They could spend it all 150,000 in year one, or they could divide up $30,000 per year for that, that, particular, that particular school. So in addition, they, um, they came up with MIVs, Managed Internal Broadband Services. So you got basic maintenance, basic maintenance of internal connections, BMIC, and you got MIBS, Managed Internal Broadband Services, which is what we're here to talk about today. But it's important to understand how the FCC got to this point, because um, that informs the differences between a, a basic maintenance offering and the MIBS offering. We can go to the next slide, please. So the current program structure, um, and, and for those, th those folks out there that actually fill out the Form 470, um, while service providers can't tell you how to fill a form out a Form 470, we can point out that uh, if an applicant wants basic maintenance, they need to ask for basic maintenance. If they want internal connections, they need to check the internal connections box. And if they want MIBS, they need to check the MIBS box on the Form 470. And you don't have to choose between them. You can, you can, you know, you can have an application where you you want a Cisco router and SmartNet, which would be you checking internal connections and basic maintenance, or you want a Cisco router and you want a MIBS on top of that, or whichever configuration, which we'll get to in, in just a moment. So category two currently has three subcategories: category two internal connections, category two basic maintenance, and category two MIBS. Now, there are some uh, errors built into this process in that if you don't check MIBS on the Form 470 and you accidentally apply for MIBS, um, say you get a, a proposal response that it has a really great MIBS offering that you didn't think about, the fact that you didn't click that box on the Form 470 makes you forever unable to use that Form 470 to get MIBS. If you want, if you really like the MIBS offering, you'll have to refile the Form 470. Um, they cannot change between subcategories during the program review uh, uh, that USAC uh, conducts. Okay, so, uh, no so pressure. Huh? <laughs> Excuse me? No pressure. No, 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 no pressure. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So what does MIBS do? So first of all, you can have you can put managed services on anything that's eligible under category two. You can buy a router under category two. Therefore, you can get a managed router. You can get managed cabling, although that's not quite as popular. You can get a managed firewall, which is very popular. You can get managed access points. You can get managed caching services. You can get a managed uh, UPS. All of those. Um, all of those internal connections pieces can be purchased as managed um, services. You, a MIBS offering will, will provide network monitoring and management, meaning your service provider can have a network operations center <clears throat> and, they, and if they've contracted to watch your 10,000 access points, they have a nice little readout and all your, their, your access points will show up on their screen so they know when things aren't working and they can do configuration pushes and management generally from their, from their console. And if Bob, a question, prepare, a quick question, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. A quick question came in from the audience about MIBS and spelling out what exactly MIBS is. So to kind of spell out the acronym. Managed Internal Broadband Services. Okay. So it essentially is designed to, um, when you buy a category one service, you buy an internet connection, it comes with a pipe, it comes with the customer premises equipment, and it's all maintained and, and monitored 
by the internet access provider. And a wide area network works the same way. So this, this is an attempt to make, if, if you wish, to make your category two, your stuff inside your building function the same way so that a service provider can watch it for you, do your configuration changes, do your troubleshooting, repair and replace it if, if necessary. Um, it can also be purchased with or without equipment. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in the past, um, before 2014, um, applicants had could could buy internal connections where they they buy and own they take title to a router, and they get basic maintenance to fix that router if it if it breaks. That was the one option that an applicant had. There are now two more options for applicants as they decide what they how they want to source their equipment. They still they can still buy the router outright and add basic maintenance to it. But the uh, option number two is they can get their equipment either through E-Rate or some other way. It doesn't really matter as long as it's L as long as it could have been bought with E-Rate. If the PTA wants to get together and give a, a big old firewall to the district, that's terrific and bake a lot of cookies. So as long as it could have been bought with e it can be managed. So option number two is um, they get they get a piece of equipment, either through E-Rate or not, and then put the management services overlay on top of that, which would take the place of basic maintenance um, in this offering. Ma uh, managed service is essentially a higher form of basic maintenance. It does a lot that basic maintenance doesn't do. And option number three is if a customer doesn't have a, a router and they just want the service provider to deliver the router and just watch it, a turnkey solution, that's option number three. They get MIBs for the equipment and the services overlay. So three different options. The differences between MIBs and basic maintenance. So both MIBs and basic maintenance will do break fix um, the comment to the extent of the requested amount. As I talked about before, um, break fix has to be done on a time and material basis with a basic maintenance offering. So they you have to put in a, um, um, a set amount, amount for parts, amount for labor and, and transport and all the rest of that. Um, if, and there's no, going over that. So one of the advantages to, to buying, you know, just SmartNet as, as it is, is they amortize the cost of, of, of equipment failures over um, everybody's SmartNet. So sometimes you pay a little more for something you don't need, but it means that you don't get really stuck if you've got a $10,000 repair budget to fix your $50,000 router. Um, in addition, uh, um, both MIBs and basic maintenance include phone support. So you could pick up a phone and get somebody at the other line. Um, both MIBs and basic maintenance include software pushes and patches. So if, if, if version 16.1 becomes 16.1.1 or becomes 16.1.2, et cetera, both MIBs and basic maintenance will cover um, that, that push of the new software onto your equipment. MIBs is a fixed price offering. Whether it's done monthly or done yearly, it's going to cost you X amount of money, but that covers the the uh, the, the break fix and all the rest of that. Where basic maintenance is is not fixed price; it's time and materials. MIBS does not require proof of work for uh, for getting reimbursed. And generally, with a MIBS uh, offering. The customer pays one price, either monthly or yearly, and the yes, and the, the feds just pay it. They don't require timesheets. They don't require um, sign-in sheets or any of that stuff. It's 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 more opaque to the to both the applicant and the service and the the feds. Um, they'll they'll simply pay it. Now with basic maintenance, applicant has to submit a budget for the repair work. The budget can't be exceeded. If the repair work falls under the budget, the remaining budget dollars are returned to the fund for future years. 
proof of work required. Technicians must keep track of mileage, must have school representatives sign timesheets. It's very paperwork intensive. MIBS is not. MIBS, your the district pays, you know, X amount of money on a per month basis and everything <clears throat> is just taken care of. If it stops working, it gets fixed. If it can't be fixed, it gets replaced. All the configuration changes are usually bundled into that. Um, and, and generally with a MIBS offering, you've got you, you know really good people sitting at the network operations center that know what they're looking at. And they can often detect a problem much quicker than the uh, the whole phone support and and getting a technician out there. Uh, your time to your time to successful repair is generally much less. And again, uh, last but not least, MIBS does that network monitoring. That basic maintenance does it. Basic maintenance is a, a is a no frills reactive uh, offering where MIBS is much much fully much more fully featured. Bob, let me ask you this. Uh, sure. Why would a district not tick that box? I mean, and, uh, there must be reasons why um, certain districts maybe wouldn't want those features and functions. Uh, I think it's a, a confluence of a few different things. Um, sometimes the applicants aren't aware of what MIBS is or, or what it does. Um, uh, sometimes they, they don't know that MIBS exists. Um, uh, MIBS has not been as popular as uh, the FCC, and frankly, I thought it was going to be. Um, uh, other than that, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I yeah. think it's just a question of education. I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but that's just me. <laughs> I second that, Bob. <laughs> so tick the box then. Check the box. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, Bob, thanks very much. That was a, a ton of information there. I think the, the history gives an important context for our uh, our audience here to understand, I mean, how this thing has evolved from something that was pretty basic, uh, but essential into something that continues to be just an essential part of any district's uh, IT budget. George, can you uh, talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, Bob's kind of laying out of these various uh, acronyms and ticking the boxes, how that resonates with the work that you do uh, with UDT. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and thank you, Bob. That was very, that was very informative. Um, I mean, lucky for, for us, for UDT and, and, and a lot of our, of our customers that, that, um, that we work with Kevin, um, you know, we've been doing this, UDT has been doing this for, for quite a while, as you can see there on the screen. Um, you know, we're established in 1995 and our roots were really, in the in the K through twelve space, right? Our our founders, um, Henry Fletcher and Gerard Amaro, that's that's where where they where they went in and, and they thought that there was a a need um, for for a service integrator, someone that that can provide and, and help schools accomplish more. So we um, we've been doing this for quite a while, and and as you can see, a few years after um, we launched this. Um, this this great program that that Bob mentioned too that that he thinks is and or we both agreed is probably the best thing since since sliced bread, um, that really helped UDT go out and really innovate and provide services for the investment that the schools were making in in this equipment right whether it be switches and routers um, some things that that Bob alluded to where you know this maintenance right and 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 staying on top of these of, of these systems and monitoring and managing them. Um, I was presenting not too long ago um, in the Texas area, and I, I brought up some data where um, I want to say 85% of the priority one tickets that manufacturers get are corrected by a software update. Hence, MIBS provides, as, as Bob was saying, things like patches and, and software updates. Right. So um, usually when when you have a, a router that's down, a switch that's down an, an, an access point that's down. Um, first thing, you know, if you call manufacturer support, first thing they tell you is, hey, do the latest update. Right. Once you do the latest update, everything's fixed. So MIBS is extremely, extremely, extremely um, beneficial. And it does play a big part in in preventive um, maintenance. There's a lot of things apart from monitoring and stuff that um, that that MIBS does. 
one of the other differences, you know, between MIBS and BMIX is MIBS is a service, right? Um, when when you get these monitoring services, um, Kevin, the you know the customer, we're we're just going through through run books and we're doing what what we do. Um, I like to say that you know UDT is very strategic strategic at the monotonous. You know, it sounds a little oxymoronic, but that's really what we are. And what we're doing is we're constantly doing this. If you're kind of in a BMIC or BMIC um, model, there, when anything that's time and materials, you know, you have to get with your service provider. Then you have to schedule some time for for something, you know, to happen. And you know, you may have a new bug fix with a with a new feature that's either a security feature that's coming in or something that's going to make your system work a lot more efficient. Maybe, you know, you're getting um, more throughput now and you have to do a software update. Well, you know, the provider may not, doesn't have someone waiting there for a, you know, for a TNM to come through, right? This, when, when you're talking MIBS, that's another big difference. Pick up the phone, email a ticket, and we jump right in and we just add this as part of the service. We may have d- just done a software update, but there's something that's needed, um, you know, a week later, on a new update, then it's all it is is a request. You put in a ticket, we go out and we perform this, right? Another thing, you know, during this monitoring and management, um, we're, we're honestly understanding the environment, right? And when you understand an environment, when you're in there and you're monitoring and managing it, you know the systems, you know the systems that interact with it, you know the dependencies. What happens is, um, Kevin, as you can imagine, whenever people do cringe when you hear the word update or when, why? Because usually an update, something something happens, right? Oh, I didn't know that was gonna affect X, Y. Because of the visibility um, that UDT as a service provider has into, into the customer's network when they sign up for, for managed services via MIBS, um, we, we really, 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 really bring down the, the possibilities of something catastrophic happening. What I mean by catastrophic is, you know, another system going down, bringing down a uh, an internet connection, et cetera, something that that can affect the the uh, the education system or the systems of the of the school. So there's a lot of benefits when 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 you provide um, when we're coming in and providing MIBS just because of the visibility, right, and the constant proactive nature um, of the service, right. Um, UDT overall in in building these models, right? We we work very closely um, um, with Bob, and we get we get educated just like Bob is doing now. Um, I think Bob can attest to this. This just th- these things are changing, right? So we need to be up to speed, and and we've been doing it. Hence why, um, as you saw there in the in the prior in the in the prior slide, you know we're we're the number one category two e rate provider in the state of Florida, right? Besides the point that it's near and dear to our heart, we understand the value that this brings. So not only in providing these services, but sitting down and being consultative um, with the districts, you know, providing webinars like these um, is is a big part of what we do. And not only when we're in 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 AMIBS, we're talking about their current infrastructure, right? Giving them data. Yeah. Um, you know, our systems that we put in to remotely monitor and manage these systems is giving us constant data. And that allows us, allows the district when we provide them this data and go over it for them to make educated, um, a kind of an, an educated roadmap to what the next phase or what the next type of system they need. Do they need something? Do they, do they need wider? Is there, um, do they have enough coverage when it comes to to access points, um, what is the throughput of the firewalls? Are they going to be upgrading their internet con- their internet connections coming in? Right? Is the is the firewall going to support it? Right? Um, or is a new building coming up? How many ports are available at their access layer? Um, what is the saturation of their of their access points and their and their Wi-Fi covered? So this is all very 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 key information, right? That we not only are we keeping the systems up, but we're giving them data. Right, that they have at their at, at their fingertips through our interactive and real time dashboards. That's telling them, you know, maybe there's a certain model we can go in and tell them, hey, X Y Z model of X X Y Z manufacturer. Um, you know what, that 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 model wasn't too good, right? We have about you know 300 tickets this year that came in, you know, either a failing port, a failing interface. You know, we had to replace a fan. So now we have it. You know, we have some. We've been educated in the type of system. So now when we come in and there's a replacement or a refresh, now we have actual data, right? Now we know exactly, and we're making 
um, educated um, assumptions as to what we can expect, you know, what a certain model did, you know, how it reacted, you know, was it, you know, was the capacity, did we capacity plan correctly, et cetera. So apart from monitoring, managing, we're also collecting data and providing this data real time to our customers um, and to the district so that they can understand, you know, what the state is. So George, we haven't had many questions coming in from the audience, so I'm going to channel one um, from from them. Uh, as okay. I as I listen to you talk about you know, these sophisticated systems of, of monitoring, uh, you talk about how UDT is servicing seven of the the biggest ten districts in the country. Um, question came up for me: It was just like, does this do these models vary upon size? I mean, as I sit here in the state of New Jersey, there are probably some districts that are smaller than a single high school in some of those largest districts uh, in terms of the number of students. Can you talk a little bit about the scale and, and the variety of services depending on the on the size of a district? Absolutely, and, th and that's a great question, Kevin. Thank you for for um, for your channeling superpowers there. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, so with that said, definitely look um, and 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 our ability to be able to to scale up or to scale down. Um, quickly is a is is a big value add, and what I mean by that is, look, we understand in you know as as you mentioned, you know, in seven we're we're right currently we're in probably in about seventy school districts nationwide, right? And again, there's forty seven within the state of Florida, and they vary, right? They vary. Um, you know, we have school districts in Texas, like you said, that have one high school, um, you know, one elementary school, and one. Um, middle school, right? It's, it's three schools. So there, there's probably less IT presence within the staff. So there is a more of a need and and more handholding, if you would. You know, at in the larger districts, right? We're doing more of a very specific role. Hey, you monitor, manage, and then we built custom standard operating procedures to be very specific and fill the gaps for the these larger school districts that have larger IT departments. And what we're seeing today in the technology landscape is that schools have to be very strategic internally, right? Especially these larger school districts, you know, we have, there's, there's a lot of, let's call it um, competition, if you would, that's coming in, you know, public, um, private schools are becoming very, very, very technologically advanced and stuff. And even within the schools and, and, and students moving from with, within districts, et cetera. So the ability to be number one from a technology standpoint is huge, right? It, it, it really attracts students. It's doing a lot um, for the students, the, the outreach that they have. So IT departments within the schools today are really being challenged with becoming more strategic. How can we become more innovative? How can we protect the student's um, devices? How can we build a roadmap, you know, for the future so they're not so that we're being strategic as we grow from a technology footprint and less reactive, right? So therefore, in those larger school districts, we have a very specific role, and that's hey, keep the lights on, let's be efficient, but most importantly, um, the service has to be evolutionary, meaning as they are growing from a technology footprint, our, our solution has to be able to keep up with it. We cannot become a roadblock. We can't introduce risk. We have to always be resilient inside of a, of a school district and inside. So, and that resonates well when you're talking with the, in the, in the smaller school districts, we have to be hands-on. We have to be present. We have to participate more from a, from a consultative standpoint. Right. Um, we have to go ahead and, and be translators. Right. I need to translate ones and zeros to basic, you know, and, 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 and speak to 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 the board. And sometimes we're even speaking, as, as Bob was saying, to the cookie making um, PSAT by the um, I mean, parent teacher um, associations. Right. So we're, we have to go in and present to them. So we have more of a of, a, of an active role in these. Right. Right. Our ability to really keep foundationally what we're doing. Um, Kevin, the largest school districts and the smallest school districts, smallest school districts are getting the same advanced foundational solution that the large districts are getting to when they when they subscribe to our services. So it, it balances out well. Yeah, Bob, does that resonate with you? you talk a little bit about your experiences uh, between the, the the size of districts and their needs when it comes to E rate and their their needs in terms of 
um, the sort of uh, advice and consultation that, that George is talking about? Well, I, I think it's completely true. Um, before, uh, you know, before Hartford, you know, I worked for an, an educational reseller up in Connecticut. And what we found is the really small districts would find usually the best either science teacher or math teacher and promote them to be the technology person for the school, if not <laughs> for the district. And districts get to a certain size and then they realize that they really need to insource some help. So they add a technician. And then the district, larger districts may get um, a, a, a fledgling network person and a, and a technician. So the, it multiplies. So the, the really, really large districts have at least a prayer of having somebody qualified to do any of this stuff on staff. But in, in, the, in the land of diminishing budgets, um, you know, the support people who aren't actually teaching children um, are generally the first to go, all the central office staff, you know, and then the IT folks are, are, are that. And so, yeah, generally I find that it doesn't matter that the size of the school or the size of the district, they don't have the, very often, they don't have the technological expertise to maintain the networks that they have to have to deliver services to their kids. So they, they turn to good folks like UDT in, in order to say, hey, you know, should I, I, we need to upgrade our network. Should we get an ATM network or a gigabit ethernet network? Or, yeah. you know, what's what's the latest trend in Wi-Fi? What's, I mean, you know, is A do 2.11A? Is A the newest one? Oh, then now there's B. How about C? Now we dump right to G, you know. Right. <laughs> all, all those things. So so they absolutely need a, a technology translator and partner to, to help them navigate um everything that they need it's not just enough to be a history teacher anymore but you know you'll you'll know history but and how to take all that content out there and and get it down into usable format for the for the kids and keep that running you, you need a you need a friend or a yeah. partner yeah yeah because absolutely we, and and having that real time and real and real world data and experience um, um, on our side, Kevin, really helps us when we're, because of the the the, the vast variety of, of, of networks, school districts, and, and scenarios that we see when we come in and we're talking um, to, to, a, to a district and stuff, whether it's smaller or larger, we have all of this data of what we've seen, what we're doing, what's worked, what hasn't worked. We've ran into that wall. We have the bruises, right? We have the, the, the 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 war scars right to come in and say hey this this works in this type of scenario and we can be very specific yeah hey so um questions coming in from the audience now thank you rachel uh one uh how is mibs and other e-rateable services going to potentially be affected by the notice of proposed rulemaking how does udt navigate those changes so i guess that first one comes to you george and uh, well, I'll make the assumption that you know what the notice of proposed rulemaking is, because <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I think um, I'll let Bob. Bob can probably um, translate that because I'm not sure that that everyone does. I'll I'll probably say it in, in in my version, but Bob will probably be a lot more eloquent in in explaining that rule, and then I'll I'll chime in on what UDT's role is. Sure. So yeah, specifically the, the the notice of proposed rulemaking came out at the end of July, and it was a two-parter. The first part was dealing about dealing with tribal libraries on Native American um, reservations, and then the second part, and the, the first part was was pretty much a pro forma. The the FCC knew what they wanted to do, and they've since done it. The second part it involved a lot of changes in terms of um, how the uh, how the how the you know some of the 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 peculiarities of the program and the paperwork and and one one specific one that I'll, I'll talk about is they are discussing whether they want to eliminate the subcategories of category two. Remember what I was talk, talking earlier about the gotchas about you know you got to check basic maintenance or you got to check MIBs or you got to check internal connections and there's no moving between them after the fact. Um, if they if they get rid of the subcategories of service and um, and I'm um, strongly in favor of that, um, my my suggestion or my comments will read that they should get rid of category two, 
all three of the subcategories and go to category two recurring and category two non-recurring. Mm -hmm. So recurring versus non-recurring talks about uh, service delivery window uh, and uh, extendability uh, if an application if if they fund an application yet. Category two in uh, internal connections, which is non-recurring one time, can be extended. Uh, if the funding um, uh, commitment comes in after March 1st of the following year. So you can rather than have an, an, um, in, recurring services have a 12 month window, non-recurring services have three months before and three months after for an 18 month window. And that can be extended where recurring services cannot be extended. So my suggestion is since they really want some services to be recurring and some to be not recurring, then you simply say category two recurring category two non-recurring and allow those things to be corrected after the application is funded, which will eliminate a lot of the, the gotchas in the program. Plus, if a, if a, a customer says, you know, I, I want to get SmartNet on my router, then somebody can come in and say, well, yeah, you, you can get SmartNet, but hey, I've got this really cool offering. It's called MIBS and it's this much more money, but it does all these additional things that that SmartNet doesn't do. Correct. Yeah, but George, well, can, yeah. So, give us a little bit more even from from UDT's perspective, and in terms of the the use of that. Yeah. So, so definitely from from the standpoint of um, when these recurring services, or let's call them, or or even those managed services, right? They they definitely um, benefit from. You know the the manufacturers um, warranty, meaning the stuff like the smart net that that Bob was mentioning, right? So, but these services are also um, kind of an insurance program, right? Where where if you have a system and that system is is rated to last you, you know, the time that the, the money even so that you get a return on your investment and those and systems now, you know how technology is, right? If if something um, is something still relevant within three years, then you definitely got your money's worth. Well, what the what this um what MIBS and what the, the services that UDT provides from a remote monitoring and management, for the most part, it's probably gonna guarantee that you're gonna get those three, maybe even a, a four or a fifth year of of life of these of these systems. Why? Because we're keeping them up to date, because we're not dropping a piece of software that isn't compatible with. Um, with a chipset that 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 there may be, or with an interface that then goes ahead, and what happens is it deteriorates the system because the system is working at a level that it shouldn't be, and therefore now the system that could have lasted you three years now is lasting you two years, right? So overall, you know, when you know leveraging MIBS to 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 bring in a this these managed services is definitely like like an insurance policy, if you would, or a or definitely an upkeep policy for your systems to that you get the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah, and, um, and thank you, Rachel. Some more questions coming in here, one of which I, I had as well. You know, Bobby started talking from 1996 and the 2400 ball routers. Technologies obviously can continue to expand. Issues um, that districts face when it comes to the implementation of these infrastructures continues to change and the priorities go up and down. I mean, even during the pandemic, uh, the idea of cybersecurity uh, and network defenses is something that is certainly at the top of every school director, tech director, CIO's uh, list. Um, and some of the audience has been reading about discussions that E-rate may be expanded to include cybersecurity. Bob, they're wondering, how do you anticipate that change impacting these processes or do you see it uh, impacting them in the short term or than in the long term. So um, a couple months ago, the chairman Rosenworcel um, uh, um, uh, put out a, a paper that they're going to do, or they're intending to do a a pilot program of cybersecurity, and they think they put a like a hundred million dollars into it, maybe maybe a little bit more, um, and and. But we, we don't know if there's any rules around that. We're not sure if it's going to be part of the E-rate program. It's going to have a separate rule set. There's been no information. Uh, because of the LAUSD 
uh, uh, ransomware attack that was two or three years ago. The, the whole thing about cybersecurity hit ahead, and everyone, everyone to you know, on both sides of the the the, the political aisle and the FCC said, "Yeah, we need to do something about this." Um, I, I'm not sure that that ten years after it really should have been done is in the nick of time, but you know, they're 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 going to do it. The wheels of justice turn slowly, as we know. Um, so so. Uh, it is it is our hope that if they if they do a pilot program this year rather than an actual um, rule change that incorporates it into the E-ray program, which we really think they should do, then they'll do the act. If, if they do the pilot program and then the rule change and actually bring it into the program, then that it'll happen this year or probably next year. Um, what they're going to do still remains to be seen. Now they have a budget in place. One of the, the things that changed between 2014 and now is they went to a district-wide budget rather than a per-building budget. So they're going to take the total number of kids in a in a district, multiply that by 165. That's their budget for five years for the district. They could spend it all on one school or divide it up however they want to do it. Um, so that makes it makes things like shared services like cybersecurity much easier to, to manage rather than having to take a little bit of money out of this building and this building and this building to, you know, all that. So, um, so actually increasing efficiencies instead of making things more complicated. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> now where the rubber meets the road in this particular case is cybersecurity is a colossal um, umbrella of, of services. Um, there are a lot. There are a number of services that everybody agrees should be included: antivirus, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, um, access control, uh, defensive uh, DNS, uh, um, and um, denial denial service, access control, intrusion prevention. Yeah, virus control and defensive DNS. Those those five. But there's, I mean, there's zero trust. There's um, um, all sorts of you know protecting applications. All, I mean, just it, it it it's an endless professional uh, development, right? I mean, it, professional having, development. Yes. So yes, there's a behavior. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yep. and, and the program is was specifically constructed um, in year one in 1998 to be a low OSI model infrastructure program. So the theory would be that things that things that um, that the program would cover in terms of cybersecurity would be that low level of, of the infrastructure, but how to, how to separate that and craft a rule set um, that is, is going to be, um, you know, do what the FCC intends without just make really making this spirally complicated um, addition. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they, how they do that. Um, my, my personal personal viewpoint is they should they should fund those five uh specific functions and then stop and and not go further until they give it a couple of years and see how that how that transpires see the yeah. effect it's going to have on the individual um dis, you know the district budget i mean they're not going to bankrupt the program but they might they might it might encourage a school to bankrupt itself so we'll have to see how that happens yeah yeah and uh, George, I mean, how would you yeah. see uh, UDT helping E-rate applicants navigate a change like that? So, so look, today um, we have um, services that, that the schools have to dive into to um, to their to, because of the because of where we are today from a from a security and from a threat landscape, right? Um, we we've seen and and as, as Bob mentioned, you know, the the LAUSD. Um, incident you know a few years back did did um, um, I guess bring this to to the forefront where a lot of school districts are tapping into today into our co consultative services we have a, a service that's our um, um, virtual chief information security officer right there's really nothing virtual about it we have um, our our security professionals um, and even UDT's um, chief information security officer that is participating in 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 being a a consultative um, ally to the to the CIOs of the district from a security standpoint right um, things like today you know Bob was mentioning a lot of what Bob is mentioning is at the at the core of the infrastructure but data is clearly telling us right and and some of the things that where 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 we're concerned and 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 how 
this program is going to take effect is that um, threats and compromises are happening and, 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 and where the, the perpetrators are coming in through is at the end user, right? And we know how many end users, right? We have school districts that have over, you know, um, 400,000 endpoints, right? And, and, and even from a student standpoint, right? So reaching out to this, this is, this is a, a huge undertaking. Right, not only from a cost perspective, but also from a technology perspective. Right, being able to gather all this data and do what you really need to do to have a comprehensive security program in place that's really going to improve your posture. Right, threat hunting at this level. Um, believe it or not, the students become very um, creative or, or um, very curious as into, hey, what's this that I see in YouTube, and 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 let me see what I can do here. Right, so. So there's different type of, of threat actors that you're dealing with. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that there's going to be probably too much focus, Kevin, in on the core infrastructure and not enough at the edge, which is what we call it. And at the edge is where there's a lot of this that, that's happening. So what we're doing today is we're, we're, um, we're partnering with, um, with a lot of districts where we're providing this, these consultative CISO um, services where we're talking them through them, getting them ready, seeing what we can do um, with different fundings and what we can do with what the schools have today. Also partnering, right? We, we've we put um, a lot of time and, and effort into building great partnerships with, with um, you know, sponsors like the one that are, that are working today with Microsoft and how can we leverage um, the technologies that Microsoft has and the investments that the that the the districts have made in this technology to protect them. Well, I knew the the toughest part of my job this afternoon would be to uh, end this conversation. There's there's so many uh, hugely important factors for for districts to consider. Uh, and, and Bob and George, you really I think did a, a marvelous job in terms of bringing these things together and and giving some some good insight. So. Uh, I'd like to thank you both today for a very informative presentation. I'd also like to thank uh, the audience members, especially you, Rachel, for joining, joining us as well with, with some great questions. Uh, as a reminder, you'll get a slide within the next few days that contains a link to the recording along with the slides. If you take a look at the information here up on this, on this final slide, if there's other information you may be interested in uh, hearing about for UDT's next webinar, be sure to, uh, you know, when you get the presentation, you'll be able to click through and, again, give some more ideas and insights from your side because we want to make sure we're following uh, what you need to know. So thanks again, everyone, for participating and have a great day.